Hey everyone, welcome back to Jardev. Today I'm doing something very different. Today I'm going to be reviewing a album, a musical album. The album I'm reviewing today is The Weakness of Virtue by Soul Mass. It was released on January 28th, 2019. It's available on their Bandcamp page, soulmass.bandcamp.com, for $10 US. And it is described as soul-crushing death metal. It's, it's very heavy, very death. So just before I talk about the album, I want to talk about my own kind of musical background a little bit, for people who don't know. Um, I started listening to heavy metal when I was about 14. Started with like Def Leppard, which isn't very heavy. I uh, got into like Megadeth and Slayer. And then kind of went all over the place until over like the past five years, I've just been listening to metalcore pretty much. But over that time, I, I'd listened to all kinds of metal, like I said. Um, even death metal, like I listened to quite a bit of Dimmu Borgir, I think that's how you pronounce it when I was in high school, a fair bit of like Sepultura, and when I was about 19 or 20 I actually had a uh, a blog, like a, one of those Google blogs, blogger or blogspot or whatever they are, where I reviewed albums, I'd go like track by track and just write a little write up for each of them, so I have done this a little bit before, I know it's, it's not video games, but I I'm pretty familiar with music. So the band Soul Mass actually very kindly sent me an advanced copy of the album. Um, I didn't quite get this review out before the album came out, but I've been listening to it for just under a week now. This is Soul Mass's second full-length album. They've also released two other EPs, which you can also find on their Bandcamp page. But they are basically a Dark Souls death metal band, which Obviously, knowing my gaming interests, I was very interested. Uh, I have actually bought all their other albums before, so I've listened to them quite a bit before. So I was I was very excited at the opportunity to get an advanced copy of this and to be able to do a review of this album. So there's nine tracks on the album, and the overall length is one hour, eight minutes, and 55 seconds. And the songs range in length from four minutes and two seconds all the way up to 13 minutes and 44 seconds. The songs cover all three Dark Souls games, no Demon Souls here unfortunately, but I was actually surprised to see that there's more songs about Dark Souls 2 than I was expecting, because I, I really feel like I am one of the only people who really likes Dark Souls 2 lore, but Soul Mass is obviously another group of people who do appreciate Dark Souls 2. So of the nine songs, two of them are about Dark Souls 3, two are about Dark Souls 2, and the other five are all about Dark Souls 1. So we'll just go through track by track now. Uh, the first track is called To Paint a New World. It's 10 minutes 35 seconds. And it basically tells the story of the Ashes of Ariandel DLC for Dark Souls 3. Come share this our All of the songs are very lore heavy, which I'm fortunate enough to be able to uh, understand most of it because I've read all the Beyond the Grave books, I've watched all of Vati's videos. To Paint a New World is actually very cool because it kind of, it goes back and forth between most of the major characters of at the Ashes of Ariandel DLC. So it starts from the perspective of the bug people who, like, there's a, there's a bug person in the cave who first talks to you when you enter the DLC. And he's saying things like, come make this your home, embrace them all, let all decay. Then it changes to talk about the forlorn warriors. And then moves on to Wilhelm, who does his, um, basically his speech, like, almost word for word. I've seen your kind here before, time and time again. Then it switches to the painter, the painting girl, uh, as Vati calls her, Arya. The, the, the lyrics just refer to her as painter. Or the painter. Then towards the end, it switches to Father Ariandel, who says, like, bring my flail, please, Frida. And then it switches back to the painting girl for the end. And obviously this is a pretty, it's, a, it's an epic song, going over 10 minutes, switching back and forth from perspectives. Um, the music shifts for each perspective as well. So the next song is called Blacksmith's Wisdom. It's 5 minutes 34 seconds and is about the character of Steady Hand Macduff, who's the blacksmith from Dark Souls 2. When I first saw the song title, I definitely assumed it would be about, um, like, Andre, the blacksmith from Dark Souls 1 and 3. But, no, it, very interestingly, it is about Dark Souls 2. 
And this is actually quite a a simple song, like lore-wise. It's it's literally just some of the dialogue from Macduff, just in a song form. It, it's still still very good, but it's it's it, it's quite nice to have a little bit of a, a step back to a simpler song after the incredible epic opening of To Paint a New World. So after that, track three is Praise the Sun, which is four minutes, two seconds. Which is the second shortest song they've ever done. I believe there's a shorter one on the debut album. But it's the shortest song on this album. I wrote that it's easily the most accessible song. Uh, it's short. It's about the most easily recognized character in all of Dark Souls, Solaire. Its title is probably the most common saying in all of Dark Souls. It is the perfect song to try and get their name out there. I think that is a great idea. This was also the first advanced single. This came out on YouTube. I think it was about a week or two before the full album came out. And obviously the song tells the whole story of Solaire. It starts at the beginning. Um, sort of implies that Solaire has been summoned to a world, like right from the start, and he knows the struggle's just begun, it's time to fight. But very quickly, it actually gets very sad. Obviously, Solaire has a, a very sad story. Um, but even by like the, the second paragraph of the, the lyrics, he's already kind of despairing. Have I not searched enough? Am I a fool? And I was quite surprised that the, the song actually ends on the bad ending of Solaire. He he, he kind of gets overcome by the, the sunlight bug, or the chaos bug, or whatever it is. Um, and it ends with him saying, Madness is all that I have left, crawling deep within undead flesh. It's dark, so dark. Which is very sad. It, it, it ends without the player saving Solaire from, from the dark. And this actually becomes a, a bit of a theme of the album. There's um, a series of three, four songs about all about different characters, four songs in a row, and they're all very depressing, so the album very much embraces the bleakness of the Dark Souls story. So next we have Remember My Name, which is 6 minutes 26 seconds, and is about the character of Lucatiel from Dark Souls 2. Lucatiel's story is also very sad. She uh, goes hollow and slowly forgets all about her previous life and towards the end of the game uh, barely recognizes the player anymore. In the very last encounter with her, she does still remember the player. She starts by saying, like, who are you? And then she says, oh, of course, I know you. And she finishes by telling the player to remember her name. But again, just like the previous song, Praise the Sun, Remember My Name, tells a very sad story of Lucatiel. It ends with her basically forgetting herself. The final lyric is, I've been reduced to a shell of what I once had been, but I can no longer tell. And that's how the song ends. So there's no like dim glimmer of hope that she will remember herself. In, in this song, she does completely forget herself, and all that's left is her name. Which, funnily enough, like the, the phrase, remember my name, is said in this song, but the name Lucatiel is never brought up, which I think is very fitting. So track number five is A Once Proud Knight, which is 8 minutes 46 seconds. Daughter, you when I first looked at the title, I definitely assumed this would be about the character of Oscar of Astora, who is the character in the Asylum right at the start of Dark Souls 1, who frees the player. But it is actually about Siegmeier of Katarina. And again, just like the previous two songs, it's a very sad story. Um, it ends with him going hollow, and again, like very similar to the first, um, to the Remember My Name song, he forgets himself, says bloodlust wells up within, losing control. I think I probably would have struggled to tell just whose character this was, especially because I've never successfully done Siegmeier's quest. In Dark Souls 1, I always see him outside Sens, see him in Sens, and then never see him again. <laughs> but the final lyric of the song is, Thank you, my little Lin, which if you kill Siegmeier, he mentions Lin. And also on the next page of the lyric book is a picture of uh, the, the onion armor. So, I mean, that would tell you too. 
but I did actually read the Lin part before I saw it, and I was like, oh yeah, that, that must be Siegmeier. Musically, I think this is probably my second favorite song of the album. Um, they're about halfway through, there's a guitar solo, which I thought was very Dream Theater-like. Uh, obviously used to be a, a huge Dream Theater fan, and it, it the, the solo just made me think of, of Dream Theater. And right at the end of the song, there is a bass solo, which I actually, my first instrument was the bass guitar. I was very inspired by Cliff Burton of Metallica and everything he did with the bass, so it was really cool to hear a bass solo in this album. Track 6 is called Spear and Hammer, and it is 4 minutes 44 seconds. And this is about the characters of Ornstein and Smaug. This one doesn't actually tell their lore, it's a musical interpretation of the battle with these two characters, and it's, it's a very clever song. So it's told from the point of view of the player as they, they first step into the boss room and see these two golden armored behemoths, basically. Um, the player has to run, dodge, and roll, seize opportunity or die. But eventually the tide turns, Ornstein takes a mortal strike, and the knight collapses. So in this version of the fight, the, the player does kill Ornstein first and fights Mega Smaug. But just like the previous three or four songs, it's a very sad ending because the, <laughs> the player does die to Mega Smaug. Psychotic laughs as he crushes you slowly, immense destruction and death is so pleasing. Musically, this is such a clever song. Um, it's very, very fast-paced. Like, it's only... It's, it's just under five minutes. Um, but it's very fast-paced until the final two lines of the song, which... It, it basically, it's fast-paced for the whole part where you're fighting, but then when it slows down, it describes the player being crushed by the hammer of Mega Smaug. And I just thought that was so clever, like it's so fast during this frantic battle, and then as the player's life is slowly being crushed out of them by this giant electric hammer, it slows down to very chugging and like methodical pace. I, I thought that was so clever. The seventh track is called When the Flame Begins to Fade, at 6 minutes and 13 seconds. <laughs> And this tells the story of just before the events of Dark Souls 1. It basically tells the story of the, the whole opening cutscene for Dark Souls 1, um, starting in the, the land of grey arch trees, um, moving into the battle between the gods and the dragons, and then it ends just as the, the flame is beginning to fade. So it, it does, it just goes over the whole cutscene. And it touches on every point of that cutscene. It talks about Seath betraying his own kind. Uh, it talks about the Witch of Isolith desperately trying to create another flame and become being reborn as the Demon Lord. It talks about um, Gwendolyn and Frampt establishing the illusion of Guinevere and Anne Orlando after Gwyn's left. And there's a part at the end that I think Nobody is going to make this comparison, but it sounded very Queen-like to me, um, very bright and rock. If anyone's familiar with that song, it's a lot of it's very echoed and layered guitars. Like Brian May will play like a little little riff, and then like a second delay later, that riff will echo. And the the end of when the flame begins to fade just sounded very similar to that to me. So I don't know if there's some Queen influences in there. Um, that's what I heard, personally. The penultimate song is The First Sin, and it is 8 minutes and 55 seconds long. This world of and Obviously the concept of The First Sin is quite vague, it's never really established in the games, but the, the most common theory, and the one that Vati put forth, is The First Sin is Gwyn initially linking the fire, and that is the version of the first sin that Soulmass has gone for in this song. So I assume the band members are probably a fan of Vati. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, but that is what I would guess. And this song is told from the point of view of humans, as they question whether linking the fire is really the right thing to do. Um, for example, what lies beyond the scope of light, what lies beyond the reach of dark, we're all that remains. 
Musically, I thought this was great. There was some very prominent bass at the start of the song, which obviously I, I quite like to hear. Love some, some interesting bass playing. And the final song is called Embrace of the Gathering Darkness. This is the longest song at 13 minutes and 44 seconds. And this is an absolutely incredible song. It basically tells the entire story of Dark Souls 3. It's the most unique song on the album. It has clean vocals um, sung by Mercedes Victoria. She plays the part of the Firekeeper. I feel like this is going to be a fairly divisive song because you don't usually... A lot of people probably won't buy a death metal album and be all that happy to hear um, a clean, clean female vocals on it. But I will say this is absolutely my favorite song of the album. It is so unique. It's so epic. Uh, even more epic than the opening song. It's very progressive death metal. So I just want to say if the band is listening, love this song. Absolutely. I assume this was probably a bit of a, a risk getting some clean vocals, but I think it is fantastic. So Mercedes Victoria as the Firekeeper is basically telling the player um, what their quest is going to be, that they have to return the lords to their thrones as the, the story of Dark Souls 3 goes. There's a paragraph sort of in the middle that, that really confused me when I was reading it. It goes, the wolf knight of the past, a great giant and the last, the devourer of men, when the princes fall, they'll burn again. I was like, hang on, is this actually about Dark Souls 1, the wolf knight? You know, that's Artorius. A great giant and the last, the, the last giant from Dark Souls 2, sure. The devourer of men, oh, Smaug's a cannibal, I guess. But th that's actually just talking about the Lords of Cinder, the wolf knights, obviously the Abyss Watchers. The great giant is, is Yorm, the last of the giants. The Devourer of Men, Aldrich, and the, the Princes, Lorien and Lothric. So yeah, I don't know, <laughs> don't know why that confused me at first, because obviously everything is about Dark Souls 3, and I just saw, like, Wolf Knight, I was like, it's gotta be Artorias, but no, it's, it's very clearly uh, the Abyss Watchers. So about half of the song is very slow, done with Mercedes' vocals as the Firekeeper, and then about halfway through it switches up to very fast, heavy death metal, back to the harsh vocals, and switches to telling the story of the Ringed City. I think it's either from the point of view of humans, again, like the last song, or possibly from one of the pilgrims from Londor. Because it does say, on a pilgrimage from the church, obviously the Sable Church of Londor, Londor um, come a sovereignless hollows clad in black to find their lord at last. And if people watched my review of the Beyond the Grave Volume 2 book, which tells the lore and story of Dark Souls 3, uh, I said in that, before I read that book, that I thought Dark Souls 3 had the weakest lore. And definitely after reading the book, I can definitely appreciate this song so much more. Because it is it is pretty epic story, is Dark Souls 3. And just on the surface, compared to the other two games, it looks not that good. But... Yeah, after reading the book and really reading the lyrics for this song, definitely makes me appreciate the lore of Dark Souls 3 a lot more. So there we go, that was my track-by-track -track review of The Weakness of Virtue by the band Soulmass. Soulmass is made up of Aaron Sluss, Sluss, who plays the bass, Brett Windnigel, who plays guitar and does additional vocals, Brian Edwards, who does the main vocals, Steven Scudero, who does the drums, and Mercedes Victoria, who does the vocals on Embrace the Gathering Darkness. The beautiful album art is done by Sam Nelson, who has a pretty cool Facebook page where you can actually check out um, a bunch of similar artwork, but this is the only Souls-like one, so it's my favorite. You can actually preview the whole album on the Bandcamp page, soulmass.bandcamp.com, or you can check out the whole album on YouTube if you go to Soulmass's YouTube channel. All these links will be in the description. And remember, you can buy it for $10 US. And I believe they made a bunch of shirts with the artwork for the Indiegogo campaign. And I believe that if they have leftovers, they're going to sell them on the Bandcamp page. So keep an eye on the page if you're interested in one of those. Huge thank you again to Soulmass for sending me a copy of the album. I have actually been a fan of the band for 
like two or three years now, so it was really cool to get a, my own copy of this. If it wasn't clear, my overall opinion is I love this album. It is my favorite of all the albums so far. Anyway, thank you everybody very much for watching this. Make sure you leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys later. Bye!